Hyperion gauge fields. I will explain these terms later. For which we have given a rather uh, prosaic or a dull name, the standard model of high energy physics. I hope uh, somebody invents a better name for this. In this theory, the strong forces operating within the nuclei and within the nucleons as well as the weak forces that were revealed through the discovery of radioactivity uh, by Becquerel, uh, Curies and uh, <coughs> others 100 years ago are understood to be generalizations of the electrodynamics of Faraday and Maxwell. This should be good news for all the students because all the students are supposed to know the electrodynamics. Next. Electrodynamics was formulated almost com completely by the year 1875 by Maxwell in terms of what, what are called Maxwell equations. The 20th century owes a lot to the Faraday Maxwell electrodynamics for the applications of electrodynamic uh, technology have become a part of modern life. You cannot imagine anything without electrodynamic technology now. And uh, the dynamics of strong and weak forces, which is the standard model of high energy physics, is a generalization of electrodynamics, I said. And it turns out that that got formulated around 1970, almost 100 years later. So the moral is obvious. Equally profound applications will follow once the technologies of strong and weak forces are mastered. The four fundamental forces of nature which govern the universe are the following. Strong, electromagnetic, weak and gravity. Strong force is the strongest of all the forces known to us. And uh, <coughs> it is the force which binds the quarks to form the proton and neutron and finds a proton and neutron to form the nucle various nuclei. And its strength is measured by a strength parameter which has order of magnitude unity. Although it is the strongest force known to us, you will feel it only if you, uh, if you probe down to 10 power minus 13 centimeter. So that is called the range of the strong force. After that, it is practically zero. Next comes electromagnetic force, which is two orders of magnitude weaker than uh, strong force. And it is measured by the so-called fine structure constant, 1 over 137. It is electromagnetism which binds the uh, nuclei to the electrons and makes atoms. And it binds atoms to form molecules and by, uh, binds molecules to form uh, solids, liquids and gases, all forms of matter. So <clears throat> in the study of matter, electromagnetism is the force which you are studying. Actually, all the forces which you already know like uh, elasticity, viscosity, surface tension are all manifestations of the electromagnetism only. The range of electromagnetism is infinite. As you know, the Coulomb force is 1 over r square, so like 1 over r squared. And uh, although it uh, dies down, it does not become 0. <coughs> there is no exponential cutoff as in strong and drag. Next comes the weak force. Unlike the strong and electromagnetic forces, weak force is a disruptive forces. It causes the decays of all elementary particles as well as uh, most of the elementary particles. I'll be talking about decay by weak interaction and also the heavy nuclei <coughs> decay by weak interaction. That is a beta decay. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, uh -huh. So please request. Uh, I request everybody to. Uh, <coughs> Mute their uh, mics. Is it okay? Yeah. Oh, everything okay now? All right. So we will continue. Is there a pointer which I can use? So they will not see. They will not see. Ah, then what happens? But is there an arrow or something? So weak force is a disruptive forces which causes the decays of particles and nuclei. But weak interaction is another, oh, very good, is another major role to play in the universe. <coughs> the thermonuclear fusion reactions uh, which power the sun, which gives us uh, uh, light and uh, heat, which allows us to live, is due to weak interaction. So that is the importance of weak interaction for us, for life. 
Weak interaction also is short range, like strong interaction. I have written it as less than 10 power minus 14 centimeter, but the precise number is known as a consequence of standard model. I will come to that later. Weak interaction is very weak because of this number 10 power minus 5, and this is the so called the coupling constant, the weak interaction called the Fermi coupling constant, Fermi constant, and it has dimension of mass square. So, using mass of the proton in the mass of the pro square of the mass of the proton here, the number is 10 power minus 5. Finally, comes uh, gravitation, which is the most important force of all. Because of gravity only, you are all <laughs> sitting in your room, otherwise, we will all be flying in space. It is gravity which binds the earth and the planets to the sun. It is gravity which binds the uh, stars to form the galaxy, and uh, it is gravity which binds the galax galaxies to form galactic cluster, and so on. So, it is the gravity which governs the universe uh, yeah. at large. And its coupling constant, which is the famous Newton's constant of gravitation, again in these units it is 1 over mt squared I have put, so it comes out as 10 power minus 40. So, you can see it is very, very weak, <coughs> weaker than the weak interaction. In fact, uh, 38 times weaker than the electromagnetism, although gravity also is infinite range because Newton's law of force also is 1 over r squared, so it does not get cut off. And um, <coughs> But uh, unlike electromagnetism, it is so weak. 38 orders of magnitude weaker. However, for the, in the universe at large, it is gravity which wins. Why is that? I hope all of you know that. Electromagnetism, although it is stronger than gravity, it can be made zero by having enough number of equal number of positive negative charges. Uh, because electromagnetism has both attraction and repulsion. But gravity is always attractive. And hence, more mass, more attraction. So, you go on adding masses and all astronomical bodies have huge masses and that compensates for this 10 power minus 40. This classification which I have talked about is a standard textbook classification which you may find even in school books, but uh, <coughs> that is broken down as a consequence of the development of standard model. As a consequence of standard model, we know that electromagnetism and weak force do not stand alone. They get unified into electro weak force. And that unified electroweak force and the strong interaction are so alike, so like each other, that there is a temptation to unify electroweak with strong. That has been called grand unification. Many theories have pursued that, but still there is no uh, clinching experimental evidence for the truth of grand unification. So we will not talk about that. So we are here at the present moment, electroweak force and strong force understood through standard model. Of course, the, the grandest of all unification will be unification of gravity also. But gravity has not been understood quantum mechanically. The standard model which I am going to talk about is uh, uh, consistent with quantum mechanics. We use quantum mechanics now to understand this, whereas that understanding is still not there in gravity. Quantum gravity is still not there, although many people are trying to pursue it through string theory. String theory might ultimately give us the quantum gravity. I will talk about it towards the end of this lecture. Uh, <coughs> but again, uh, that is still not there. I mean, that is the total unification, which was the dream of Einstein. That is even further away from grand unification. Okay. Next, please. I am sorry. I have to do it, right? Since everything is a generalization of the laws of electrodynamics, so let us start with electrodynamics, which you should all uh, already know. In this rectangle, I have <coughs> I have given the Maxwell's laws, uh, all of which you should know. These are the partial differential equations which govern the behavior of the electromagnetic field, electric field E and uh, magnetic field B. And rho is the charge density, and uh, uh, small j is the current density. All these are functions of space and time, how they dance in space and time are determined by these Maxwell's laws. This is the Gauss law, which tells you how to calculate the electric field given the charge. This is Faraday's law of induction, which tells you uh, that when there is a time varying magnetic field, there is an electric field generated. And if there is a piece of metal, a current will follow. That, is, that was Faraday's great discovery. This is the analog of the Gauss law for magnetic field but there are no free magnetic charges unlike electric field and so right hand side is 0. And uh, this is Ampere's law. It tells you how 
magnetic field is generated by a given <coughs> current distribution, but Maxwell made an important addition to this, this term which is called the displacement current. Once Maxwell added that and wrote down these four equations, those were the complete and consistent system of equations. Of course, Maxwell wrote them down uh, on the basis of the experimental discoveries of many experimenters, Oersted, Ampere, and chiefly Faraday. Faraday was the inventor of the idea of the electromagnetic field. In fact, Einstein says somewhere that uh, the greatest invention of the human mind is Faraday's invention of the field concept, because field concept is the one which rules all of standard model now. <coughs> now, once this complete and consistent system of equations were uh, written down by Maxwell, many important consequences followed. Maxwell himself showed that <coughs> the electromagnetic waves exist as a consequence of these equations. I hope you can prove that. It is a very simple exercise uh, <coughs> to prove that the electric and magnetic field travel as waves. And Maxwell could calculate the speed of those waves and it came out to be 3 into 10 power 10 centimeter per second. And by that time, it was known that light travels with that speed and hence Maxwell jumped to the conclusion that light is an electromagnetic wave. This was an important discovery because until then nobody knew what light was. People knew that light was a wave as a consequence of the diffraction and uh, uh, interference studies by Huygens, Fresnel, and Young. But nobody know uh, wave in what, and it was Maxwell who solved the problem. Then Hertz <coughs> generated, showed how to generate these electromagnetic waves and study them. So uh, Maxwell's theory, Faraday Maxwell's theory, got confirmed by Hertz. These system of laws have stood the test of time for more than 100, 150 years. Even the two revolutions, namely relativity and quantum mechanics which shook the foundations of physics did not change Maxwell's equations. In fact, in the confrontation which developed more than 100 years ago between Newton's particle dynamic and Maxwell's field dynamic, Einstein resolved the uh, contradiction by standing on the side of Maxwell. He argued that Maxwell's laws are correct. They do not need any change and hence he had to change Einstein's, uh, I mean uh, Newton's laws to be consistent with Maxwell's uh, picture of space and time. And that is how uh, the famous E equal to mc squared equation was born. Even quantum mechanics do, do not change these equations, but quantum mechanics made a very profound change in the interpretation of the field E and B and the energy content in that field. In the classical Faraday Maxwell theory, the electromagnetic field energy is uh, continuous, it can be any number. But in the quantum version, the energy is quantized in terms of uh, quanta. They are the electromagnetic quanta, otherwise known as photons. And uh, that was the birth of quantum field theory. And uh, it is a quantum field theory, which is the basic language of uh, standard model and hence basic language of uh, elementary particles. But unfortunately, we do not have time because that requires <laughs> two full time, uh, full semester, two semester courses. But I, I, I will I'll just say whatever is needed. Maybe towards the end of this course, I will introduce quantum field theory, some simple concepts uh, before I construct the standard model <coughs> for you. Uh, but uh, here, for the moment, I will summarize all of quantum field theory by this box called the Feynman diagram. Here, what I am trying to do is, I ask the question, how is the Coulomb interaction, for instance, between two charged particles like electron and proton explained in the classical Faraday Maxwell theory? There, one says, that uh, an electrically charged particle like proton is surrounded by an electric field. And if you put another charged particle like electron, the electron feels that field in, uh, at its position and th that is how the interaction is explained. If the proton is moving, there will be a, uh, there will be a magnetic field also and uh, that also will be felt by the uh, <coughs> electron. That is how the electromagnetic interaction between electron and proton are explained in the classical theory. How does the quantum field theory change it? Here, any charged particle like proton is supposed to emit the quanta of electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic field called photon, which is denoted by the Greek letter gamma and the wavy line. So it emits this <coughs> wavy line, and that wavy line is captured by another charged particle in the neighborhood like electron. 
So, this is con this constant emission and absorption of the quanta or the photon which is responsible for the electromagnetic interaction. That is the <coughs> present day understanding of all interactions and this is called Feynman diagram which helps to visualize the elementary particle process and like we will be using them in our talk. Uh, <coughs> yeah. So, see how the concept of uh, interaction has evolved through the <coughs> ages. Newton introduced the force, but uh, you know when you go to study the higher forms of dynamics like Lagrangian or Hamiltonian dynamics, your force is not enough, you have to introduce potential and force is a, a space derivative of potential. But now in quantum field theory, even that potential is replaced by the emission and absorption of uh, <coughs> quanta. So, in some sense potential is replaced by square root of the potential which is the emission and absorption. So, that is how concepts uh, evolve in physics. Uh, I want to go back now a little bit. Yeah. Uh, look at this last column range. <coughs> uh, there is an important relationship between uh, the range of a force and the mass of the quantum which is responsible for that force and that relation is the inverse relationship. The range is inversely proportional to the mass of the quantum and uh, since the range is infinite for electromagnetism, the quantum mass has to be 0. That is why photon mass has to be 0. Once we have a quantum theory of gravity, its quantum uh, <coughs> is uh, graviton and that also should have 0 mass because its range also is infinite. But strong attraction is finite range. It was Yukawa who recognized the importance of this. Uh, in the year 1934 or so and so he predicted that there has to be a particle of mass uh, from this the actual mass has, can be calculated from that inverse relation and that came out to be about uh, uh, I think 280 times the mass of the electron and uh, that is what is now known as pion. We will talk about it later but that is not the complete theory. Yukawa theory is not the complete theory of strong interaction for that we have to go to standard model. Uh, similarly, weak interaction also has a finite range, so its quantum also have to be finite, I mean finite, finite mass, not zero mass and that is an important part of the standard model and that is what leads to the Higgs boson. Okay, let us go further. I think now we have all the elements uh, to move to the standard model. <coughs> standard model of high energy physics has two parts, one electroweak dynamics which is, which is uh, unified dynamics of electromagnetic and weak interactions as I already said and then quantum chromodynamics which is a new name for strong interactions. These are based on these Lie groups but I will not say much about Lie groups uh, in today's talk. I, we may say a little bit about SU2, SU3 during the subsequent talks. So, let us first go to electrodynamics, loss of electrodynamics. Uh, remember electromagnetic dynamics, electrodynamics is based on electric field and magnetic field which is a three which are three vectors and so each has three components and now we generalize the electric electromagnetic field E and B four times which is indicated by this index I, I goes from 1, 2, 3, 4 which corresponds to four kinds of fields. One of them can be electromagnetic field itself and its quantum is uh, photon as I already mentioned. The 2, 3, 4 are weak fields and their corresponding quanta are denoted W plus W minus which are charged and Z which is neutral. Now, how do, how do this W plus W minus Z uh, <coughs> play a role in weak interactions? Uh, one simple example I have given here is how the neutron decays into proton giving you electron and uh, antineutrino that is a known uh, weak interaction of neutron that is how ne that is why neutron decays and many of the nuclei decays. But neutron is not an elementary particle, it is made up of three quarks u and 2 d and proton is made up of two u's and one d. So, in the process of weak interaction, the d <coughs> goes into u, the other two quarks play only spectator roles and uh, <coughs> when uh, d goes to u, a charged w minus is emitted virtually and uh, that uh, <coughs> virtually emitted w minus goes into electron and antineutrino. So, this is the basic understanding of weak, weak process now. 
Uh, <coughs> now, uh, what about the dynamics of these uh, four electroweak fields? And that is given here in this box. You can see they are very similar to them. In fact, in the way I have written, if you forget the dots, which I will explain later, they are exactly the same as Maxwell's equations. It is in that sense they are generalized uh, <coughs> Maxwell's equations, except for the index i, which is coming on both sides of the equation. Now, the role of uh, all these particles are indicated further here. We already know the role of the photon. By exchanging it between a charged quark and an electron, you get the Coulomb interaction, for instance. Uh, but here, I have exchanged a W. D goes to U by emitting W, and that W gets absorbed by neutrino. Neutrino gets converted into G. So, you see how quantum field theory generalizes the concept of potential. Now, this is, a pot this is also a kind of potential, but here, even the particle nature changes. Not only that, see in all these uh, process, uh, <coughs> time runs in the in this direction, upward direction. So, these are all initial states, these are final states in all Feynman diagrams. Here, take the uh, neutrino, which is in the initial state, and bring it to the final state, then it will become anti-neutrino. That is one of the rules of quantum field theory. So, what does that indicate? D decays to U by emitting W, and W <coughs> goes into E and nu bar. That is what I used here in beta decay of neutron. So, even the particle number changes from one particle, you get three particles. That is one of the main things of quantum field theory. Until quantum field theory came, there was no theoretical way of understanding how a particle is created and emitted. I will explain it further in quantum field theory course, and some of the postgraduate students might already know quantum field theory. Here I have <coughs> shown the exchange of uh, this Z quantum, which is neutral. It is exactly like the <coughs> photon, but it is massive. Uh, and it uh, gives you an interaction between uh, uh, a charged particle and even a neutral particle like neutrino. So, let us go to now the strong interactions, loss of quantum chromo, uh, chromodynamics, which is shortened into QCD. Now, the electrobic dynamics is a generalization of uh, electrodynamics four times. Quantum chromodynamics is a generalization eight times. So, the field, uh, <coughs> the fields have an index alpha, Greek index, which goes from 1 to 8. And their quanta are called gluons. There are 8 gluons, G alpha. And their interchange between quarks is what binds the quarks tightly to form the proton and neutron. It, uh, I mean, the gluons glue the quarks together. That is why they are called gluons. And the dynamics of the glue field is given here. These 8 quantum chromodynamic fields, and again they are like the Maxwell's equations. But if uh, these uh, eight equations and the four <coughs> electroweak equations are so similar to Maxwell's equations, why were they not uh, discovered soon after Maxwell? And the reason is contained in the dot. So, now you have to pay attention. I am going to say some things which are not written here. Uh, let us go back to electrodynamics. Electrodynamics, all of electrodynamics can be summarized by the simple statement that every particle which has a charge <coughs> is capable of emitting or absorbing a photon. So, that is electrodynamics. That is charge, a single charge in electrodynamics. But uh, in electroweak dynamics, there are four charges corresponding to the four electroweak fields. There are four charges. Here, there are eight charges. There are 12 charges. These 12 charges in this generalized dynamics are very different from the electric charge. The electric charge is what is electric charge? Nobody asks that question nowadays because everybody thinks that they know what it is. But Benjamin Franklin, in the beginning days of study of electricity, in fact, he studied uh, that question and even wrote books on it. But all the all uh, uh, is a waste of time. We can you can throw them uh, <coughs> into the sea. Now we know that electric charge is nothing but a number, an attribute described by a number which we give to every particle. That is electric charge. But it is a number. It can be positive like proton. A negative like electron or a zero like uh, neutron or a neutrino, but it is a number. Uh, the uh, numbers have this characteristic that uh, two numbers A and B commute, namely A into B is the same as B into A. In contrast, these 12 charges in the generalized dynamics are not numbers, they do not commute if two charges A and B, if you multiply A into B is not the same as B into A. The algebra of non commuting objects is called a non-abelian algebra by mathematicians. And so, the generalization is a non-abelian generalization of the abelian Maxwell field. 
natural field is an abelian field and the four electric fields and the eight quantum chromodynamic fields are non-abelian fields. And uh, another word gauge I should introduce, I will not explain it, all of you who have studied electromagnetism should know what is uh, the meaning of uh, gauge invariance in electromagnetism, which is usually omitted uh, <coughs> for study, but it is very important. It is that idea which has been generalized in constructing the standard model. Just go back to your book on electromagnetism and look at what is the meaning of gauge invariance. So, these are called non-abelian gauge fields. So, we have four non-abelian gauge fields uh, <coughs> in uh, electrophoric theory and the eight of them here. This theory of non-abelian gauge fields uh, was fully developed by two theoretical physicists, C.N. Yang and R. Mills around the year 1954, but many more discoveries had to be made before that mathematical theory could be used in particle physics. <clears throat> they wrote the complete theory and the complete theory involves this important addition, these dots. What do the dots indicate? Uh, now, let me contrast the abelian electric charge with the non-abelian charges. I said um, every <coughs> uh, object which has charge interacts with photon, but photon itself is not charged. So, photon cannot interact with itself. So, electrodynamics is a linear theory, but in contrast, these 12 charges <coughs> are carried by the fields themselves. Like, uh, photon does not carry charge, but these 12 uh, fields are rather their quanta, the gluons as well as the big quanta. They carry these uh, non-abelian charges and hence they have to have interaction. They have to either you can emit or absorb or there is a fourth order interaction. So, in non-abelian gauge theory, these two vertices have to be added and so some modification has to be made here and which you will find in books and so on, uh, <coughs> I will not talk about it here. So, that is a complete non-abelian gauge fields which have been used in constructing uh, the weak interactions, ultra, ultra weak interactions and the strong interactions known as QCD. Uh, at this point, let me uh, say a little bit about uh, quantum gravity. If we succeed in constructing the quantum uh, gravity theory, uh, you will find that something can be said even now. What is the analog of the electric charge in uh, gravitation? I am sure you know by comparing the Coulomb law and the Newton's law of attraction, you know that uh, the charges are replaced by masses in uh, Newton's uh, uh, theory. But we are not talking about uh, the Newton's theory of gravitation. I am talking about Einstein's theory of gravitation, namely general theory of relativity. Einstein theory of gravitation. And there it is relativistic. So, uh, mass uh, is replaced by the total energy, which is uh, E equal to square root of m squared c power 4 plus p squared c squared. This is the equation which gives you E equal to mc squared. If mass is very large compared to p, you have only rest to mass energy E equal to mc squared. But the more correct equation is what I mentioned. E equal to square root of m squared c power 4 plus p squared c squared. Now, gravity gravitational field or its quantum gra uh, graviton or physical object, so they carry energy. And hence, the quantum itself carries the corresponding charge, namely energy. And hence, it should be self-interacting like Young Mills particles. A graviton can emit itself or absorb. There is a fourth order interaction. Excuse me. But in contrast to In contrast to Young Mills <coughs> theory, where Young and Mills showed that the addition of a cubic and a quartic uh, vertex makes the theory complete and consistent, in gravity does not happen. It, uh, that does not happen. Once you add the fourth order uh, vertex, you have to add a fifth order, fifth order requires sixth order, and there is an infinite number of vertices of all orders. And that is the complication of quantum gravity. Of course, Einstein did not do it this way. Einstein, Einstein had a beautiful uh, Riemann curvature form for uh, quantum gravity, which is <coughs> summed up all these series. But in order to understand it in the quantum version, we have to do like this. So, it is this which has prevented an understanding and construction of quantum gravity now. In some sense, you can say that um, as far as complexity is concerned, 
Young Mills theory is in between the simple Maxwell's theory and the very complicated Einstein's theory. Another way of saying that is in physics we have come up to understanding Young Mills theory, but we have yet to understand much more before we can construct the Einstein's uh, uh, theory in, in a quantum version. Although I have said that we have understood Young Mills theory, TCD, there is an important gap in our understanding. Now, I have talked about the quarks getting bound uh, <coughs> to form the proton and neutron via the gluons. Proton and neutron of course are seen experimentally. Proton is seen as a track in cloud chamber for instance and uh, neutron, <coughs> there are many other way, many ways of seeing the neutron. However, the quarks and the gluons are not seen experimentally. So, what happens? Why is, why is that? That is because they are supposed to be confined or imprisoned within a prison of size 10 power minus 13 centimeter, the size of the proton. That is called the confinement hypothesis that is supposed to be provable from this Young Mills equations for TCD, but nobody has been able to do it. The world's uh, uh, brightest uh, physicists <coughs> and the uh, fastest computers have been working on that problem for the last so many years, but still no, <coughs> no, uh, no positive result. Actually, uh, uh, the Canadian Institute, Clay Institute, uh, <coughs> uh, announced uh, 20 years ago in 2000, seven millennium problems, the most difficult mathematical problem, and announced that anybody who solves any of those problems will get million dollar. And this problem of proving confinement from the Angmills equations is one of those, and nobody has yet claimed that. Okay, that's next. So, let us talk about the actual <coughs> objects on which uh, the standard model works. Uh, the universe consists of two sectors called field sector and particle sector. Field sector uh, are these uh, gauge fields, the 12 gauge fields, gamma, W plus, W minus and Z and 8 gluons. And um, they are all spin 1 particles like the photon itself. Then there is one more particle which I encircled that is called the important Higgs boson which was discovered only in 2012 and its role is to give masses to W plus, W minus and Z. I will describe that a little bit later. That is a spin 0 object. If we succeed in quantizing gravity, namely the metric field is supposed to be the gravitational field in Einstein's theory and uh, its quantum graviton will have spin 2. All these are called bosons. Any uh, particle, any elementary particle which has spin in units of h cross of course, h over 2 pi, integer times h over 2 pi, it is called a boson, it satisfies both Einstein statistics. Let us go to the particle sector. Proton and neutron are composites of quarks as I have already written. The quarks are all spin half particles. So, this sector is all spin half particles, they are called fermions because they satisfy Fermi Dirac statistics. So, if you put a proton and neutron in terms of quarks, uh, you can make uh, nuclei and so U and D are sufficient to uh, form the nucleon and nuclei. And if you add electrons, then these three particles are enough to make all matter. If you add the corresponding neutrino, then thermonuclear fusion reactions also can take place. In the thermonuclear fusion reactions, the neutrino plays a very important role. So, these four particles are enough to make a fairly decent universe. However, nature repeats this quartet. Uh, these are called leptons, these are called quarks. Uh, this quartet has been repeated twice more. There is a heavy mu like the, uh, like the golden variety electron of which all of us are composed. There is a heavy electron called muon, which was actually discovered by Homi Baba. Then there is still heavier <coughs> uh, charged particle called tau and each of these charged lepton is accompanied by its own neutrino. So, there are three varieties of neutrino and this quark doublet is followed by two more quark doublets which are heavier. Now, all these also are as important as this. Actually, the big bang which, uh, which is supposed to have produced the whole universe in that all these were produced in equal number. But all these are heavier, so they decay into the lighter particles leaving the universe to be made up of only this. Now, they are being recreated in the laboratory and being studied. All of them have been <coughs> established to exist. Not only that, I have to open out uh, <coughs> one more uh, column, two more columns rather, 
anti leptons and anti core there are anti particles to all of this so in the universe uh, when the universe was formed these particles and anti particles also were produced in equal number but now we know that uh, the the universe as we know is made up of only these particles no anti particles what happened to all the anti particles what happened to all the anti matter that is one of the most important questions in physics and cosmology for which an answer has been given although it has not been established that if there are these three quartets then matter antimatter asymmetry can be built into standard model which will allow the antimatter to disappear so that is a, that is the importance of this <coughs> repetition three times these are called generations or families this is called first generation or first family this is second and this is third now one more point before i leave this uh, page although i called this the field sector and particle sector you can easily see that that's a wrong name because these fields also can come with uh, particles quanta are nothing but particles similarly the particle sector although i called it particle sector there are fields here also in quantum field theory the quarks are quanta of quark field electron is the quantum of the electric field i'm sorry electron field neutrinos are quanta of the neutrino field and so on so in quantum field theory the particle field concept get unified so the more correct name will be bosonic sector and uh, fermionic sector yeah i think now i have more or less completed the preliminary discussion of uh, standard model let me go to the next no uh, if you think that i have uh, explained all of standard model you are wrong explanation of standard model means understanding this lagrangian this is the lagrangian of the standard model of energy physics based on su3 cross su2 cross u1 gauge theory and uh, i am not uh, <coughs> flashing this just to frighten you but that is a fact so in order to understand particle physics or standard model completely you should be able to understand this that requires uh, full understanding of quantum mechanics first and then two semesters of quantum field theory or at least one semester of and one semester of particle physics so certainly <coughs> there is a long way to go but that is a challenge but uh, fundamental physics does not come easily only people who can take up this challenge should take up particle physics for study another reason why i like this uh, transparency is see in one page i have summarized all of particle physics when i started my research in the <coughs> uh, field of uh, high energy physics at that time it was called particle physics in the late 50s or early 60s uh, <coughs> nobody knew that this could be done we were all groping in the dark we were uh, of course writing papers and so on we got getting our phd's and so on but we never thought that all of that can be written all of the uh, <coughs> basic theory of particle physics can be written in one page so that is the importance of this so that is the level of progress we have made in the last uh, 50 or 60 years this also is part of that so standard model was which i have described now was constructed by theorists more than 40 years ago experimenters verified each component of this theory in the next 40 years except for one component namely the higgs boson this last missing piece was discovered only in 2012 and that was its important standard model emerged as the standard theory describing nature where do we go from here remember standard model is a theory of only three fundamental forces the fourth one gravitational force is missing and i will come to that now but before that i want to complete the standard model by talking about the higgs boson a little bit so let me go to that remember <clears throat> the vast disparity between electromagnetism and weak force as regards the ranges electromagnetism is of infinite range and the weak interaction is of short range how does the electroweak unification cope with this breakdown of electroweak symmetry i mean unification is possible only between symmetric objects and if the electromagnetism and weak force are so asymmetric how can we unify it and that was achieved by a spontaneous breakdown of symmetry what is called a spontaneous breakdown of symmetry sbs engineered by the celebrated higgs mechanism which keeps photon massless we are raising the masses of w and z to finite values so in the standard model with sbs with the higgs mechanism w and z get masses 
and 91 GeV respectively. 1 GeV is the mass of the proton, just for, remember. So, 80 and 91 times the mass of the proton. And if you look at, uh, and if you calculate the range from that inverse relations which I mentioned, the range comes out to be some well specified number you can write down here times 10 power minus 15 centimeter. And uh, this prediction of 80 and 91 GeV mass uh, particles W and Z of electroweak theory, <coughs> the, the, these, these particles with precisely these masses predicted by electroweak theory were uh, discovered in the CERN in 1982 and that was a great triumph for the theory. The idea of spontaneous uh, breakdown of symmetry originated from Nambu, although he applied it in a different context. I will go through it uh, fast, but anyway my uh, talk I think all of you can read and try to understand. But the stumbling block was the so called Goldstone theorem. This predicted the existence of a massless spin 0 boson called Nambu Goldstone boson as the consequence of spontaneous breakdown of symmetry and prevented the application of <coughs> SBS to construct any physically correct theory because such a massless boson is not observed. So, apparently we have to choose between two evils uh, which I call the devil and the deep sea, either a massless W boson which will make the weak interaction long range which is wrong and the deep sea uh, the Nambu Goldstone boson a zero mass uh, <coughs> boson which also does not exist. So, it was Peter Higgs who in 1964 showed that this is not correct. He showed that there is no Goldstone theorem. The Goldstone theorem is wrong if the symmetry that is broken is a gauge symmetry and here we are talking about gauge symmetry. So, what happens is uh, the devil brings up the deep sea and comes out as a regular massive spin 1 gauge boson. So, instead of the zero mass gauge boson, the, uh, it becomes a finite mass gauge boson that is how W and Z get their masses and the number Goldstone boson also has been eaten up. So, that is the famous Higgs mechanism. This is called the Higgs mechanism. Many others, especially Kibble, have contributed to this. It was Kibble who generalized the, the non abelian Higgs, e abelian Higgs. Again, Higgs talked about only the abelian theory. It was Kibble who made the <coughs> non trivial non abelian generalization. Earlier, Glashow had identified the correct version of the uh, SU2 cross U1 group for the, of the Young Mills theory for the weak interaction, ultra weak communication. Combining that with Higgs mechanism, Weinberg and Salam independently constructed the electroweak part. So, there is a bonus. Higgs mechanism <coughs> means it, it postulates the existence of a universal all pervading field called the Higgs field, which is supposed to exist everywhere. We do not see it, but we see it through the masses of the particles. And it is this field which gives masses to the W and Z and also gives masses to all the fermions of the particle sector except to the neutrinos. Thus, in particular, the masses of the quarks and the electron also come from the Higgs field. There is an important byproduct of the Higgs mechanism. A massive spin 0 boson called the Higgs boson must exist as a relic of the original Higgs field. High energy physics searching for, for it in all the earlier particle accelerators had failed to find it. It is something like constructing a gigantic uh, mechanical structure in which an important bolt was missing. And so, that bolt was found only in 2012. So, the discovery of Higgs boson in 2012 at a mass of 125 GeV at the gigantic particle collider called Large Hadron Collider at CERN was welcomed by everybody. This I have already said <coughs> all that has been said. So, some more is given uh, <coughs> details about the Higgs mechanism you can understand by reading this, but I will not go over that. Standard model is not the end of, end of the story. There are many more things which are expected to happen beyond standard model. First, neutrinos. Neutrinos are massless in the standard model. As I already mentioned, Higgs mechanism does not give mass to the neutrinos. About 20 years ago, experimenters discovered that neutrinos do have mass, although very tiny. And this has been hailed as a great discovery so, since this may show us how to go beyond standard model of neutrinos, standard model. Neutrinos may be the portal or the window to go beyond standard model. And that is the importance of the India based neutrino observatory, INO, which has been planned to come up in Tamil Nadu in Tenet district. Next, dark matter. Astronomers have discovered that most of the matter in the universe is not the kind we know, not the kind which we have been describing. 
it is called dark matter because it does not emit absorb or scatter light. Although this discovery has been made already, nobody by astronomers through the gravitational interaction, nobody knows what this dark matter is and only physicists can discover it. And many experiments, dozens of experiments are going on throughout the world for the last, in the last 20 or 30 years. They have been trying to de uh, detect the dark matter, but no success so far. A dark matter experiment also will be mounted in one of the K1s in the INO. <coughs> Other things, in the last four decades after the standard model was constructed, theoreticians have not been idle, but have constructed many theories that go beyond standard model. One of these is the grand unification, which I already mentioned. The other important thing is supersymmetry, which postulates the existence of a boson corresponding to every known fermion and vice versa. Corresponding to electron, there has to be a bosonic electron, a spin 0 electron. Corresponding to photon, which is spin 1, there has to be a photon with spin 4. So every particle has to be repeated. This is a very elegant symmetry and that is why uh, theories like it. In fact, it leads to a better quantum field theory than the one on which standard, standard model, the quantum field theory which we use in standard model has a very big pitfall, namely the divergences, whereas <coughs> supersymmetry uh, will be a little better theory. But if it is right, we have to discover a whole new world of particles equaling our known world. Remember, we took 100 years to discover all the known particles starting from the electron. So patience is needed. The experimenters uh, <coughs> at LHC are still searching for supersymmetry, but so far they have not found. There are many more theoretical speculations apart from grand unification and supersymmetry, but none of them has seen an iota of experimental support so far, even in the Large Hadron Collider. However, LHC will have many more years of operation, it is it's working now. Let us hope new things will be discovered. Of course, the biggest loophole in standard model, yeah, uh, is that gravity has been left out. The most successful uh, to attempt uh, to construct uh, quantum theory, quantum gravity is a string theory, but it is still an incomplete theory. Actually, the theory is complete, but there are uh, some problems. So, uh, I think I will say a little bit about it, maybe in the next five minutes. So, I will continue for another five minutes to say a little bit about quantum gravity and the string theory. I will not go over all of this, but at least a little bit. It's a deep irony of nature that the twin revolutions of quantum and relativity that powered the conceptual advances of the 20th century physics and that underlie all the subsequent scientific developments have a basic incompatibility between them. In other words, the marriage between quantum mechanics and relativity has not been possible. By relativity here, I mean general theory of relativity. Special theory of relativity has been already combined with quantum mechanics, leading to the quantum field theory, which has been used in construction standard model. Gravity, which gets incorporated into the very fabric of space and time, namely the curvature of space time, is gravity in Einstein's general theory. And that has resisted all attempts at being combined with the quantum world. So, quantum gravity has become the most fundamental problem of physics, and the most successful attempt to construct quantum gravity is string theory. Actually, string theory offers much more than a quantum theory of gravity. It provides a quantum theory of all the other forces too. In other words, it can incorporate the standard model of high energy physics also within a unifying framework that includes gravity. So I will say a little bit about string theory. In string theory, a point particle is replaced by a one-dimensional object called a string as the fundamental entity. Its length is about 10 power minus 33 centimeters which is the length scale of any theory of quantum gravity, including string theory. The various vibrational modes of the string correspond to the elementary particles. String theory automatically contains quantum gravity and that is its special beauty. The ordinary quantum field theory of fine particles, remember, we cannot include quantum gravity when it, it refuses to uh, mix with uh, uh, <coughs> gravity, whereas string theory uh, will not exist without gravity. That itself shows that string theory is the correct next step. However, <coughs> that uh, beauty is bought at a high, heavy price. It works only if the number of space dimensions is 9 and including time, it is 10. Where are the extra 6 dimensions? They are curled up to form space bubbles at a distance scales of the same 10 power minus 33 centimeters. 
both the string and the extra curled up dimensions will be revealed only when we can access such length scales. So, has Cynthia solved the problem of quantum gravity? Yes, perhaps, but how do we know? Where is the experimental support for string theory? Remember, it took 40 years to verify the standard model as the correct theory of nature. That required the construction of particle accelerators and particle colliders of higher and higher energy, ultimately culminating in the construction of the large hadron collider LHC at CERN, Geneva, reaching energies in the TeV region, 10 power 12 electron volt region. This machine is a giant. It is a circumference of 28 kilometers and its construction took 20,000 physicists and engineers working for 20 years, including <coughs> engineers and physicists from India. In relativistic quantum mechanics, there is an inverse relationship, again another inverse relationship between the length scale and the energy required to probe it. The energy required to probe a length scale L <coughs> is proportional to uh, 1 over L. I mean, you have to put the H cross and see, otherwise it becomes, uh, then it becomes an equation. I put a uh, I, I have denoted only the E and L. You have to put H cross and C to make the equation complete. Remember, I said at the beginning of my talk that we have descended down to a length scale of 10 power minus 17 centimeters. To probe this, we needed the TeV energies of large hadron collider. So, to probe the length scale of quantum gravity, which is 10 power minus 33 centimeters, we need another 16 orders more energy, namely 10 power 16 TeV. That is the energy required to experimentally test string theory or any theory of quantum gravity. Most people think this is not possible and that is the crisis which I mentioned. Galileo had decreed laws of physics are written in the language of mathematics, but those laws are, can be proved or disproved only by experiments. For 400 years physics has progressed only by following this path opened by Galileo. If we give up this path, that will be the end of fundamental physics. In that case, all the beautiful theories that we build for quantum gravity, including string theory, will remain as mere metaphysics. What is the way out? One way is cosmology, I will not talk about it here. We have to make a direct attack on the high energy frontier. Instead of merely scaling up the sizes of the accelerating machines, we must discover new principles of particle acceleration. That is the main message I want to leave here. Either new principles of acceleration have to be discovered or there will be an end to high energy physics by about 2040 or 2050. This conclusion has nothing to do with quantum gravity or Planck energy. <clears throat> Even without that, high energy physics will come to an end by 2040 or 2050 because we cannot go much beyond this uh, uh, 14 TeV uh, <coughs> large hadron collider which required 28 kilometer. People are uh, having uh, uh, blueprints for 100 TeV at the most. Maybe you can even think of 1000 TeV by uh, having the whole circumference of the earth as for the accelerator. But beyond that, what do you do? So just uh, scaling up will not do. You have to discover new principles of acceleration. Growth of accelerator energies over the past 80 years has been phenomenal. The energy has been increasing by a factor of 10 every six years. I interpret this exponential growth as an optimistic sign for the future of fundamental physics. So, if the same growth can be maintained, 16 powers of 10 can be reached in 16 into 6, which is 96 years. It may look uh, too long, but remember, this is not really too long. We took 40 years even to verify the standard model. But this is possible only if new principles of acceleration and newer technologies are continually <coughs> uh, invented. This uh, factor of 10 every year, uh, 6 years, uh, that exponential line, which is called the Livingston plot, occurs only on the basis of <coughs> jumping to newer uh, types of accelerators, Cockcroft and uh, Walton and Van de Graaff, and then the cyclotron principle and the super uh, uh, synchro cyclotron and so on. Every new principle uh, <coughs> allows you to go on sapphire. Otherwise, uh, the old uh, machines saturate beyond a certain energy, they saturate so to discover new principles. What are the new principles of acceleration? I will give one example. Uh, in the past uh, 30 years, many ideas on laser plasma acceleration are being pursued. Using laser excitation of plasma wake fields, electrons have been successfully accelerated to 1 GeV in 1 centimeter, which is to be compared to kilometer size conventional accelerators to get similar energies. So, tabletop accelerators are perhaps not far away. Maybe this will lead to breakthroughs that will help us to cross the super high energy barrier. I am not saying that laser plasma acceleration can itself achieve the Planck energy, but it will be an important step. What we need are actually 100 crazy ideas. Maybe one of them will work. 
maybe the breakthrough will come from one of you listening to me now, especially the students. This is an excellent opportunity and challenge for experimentally oriented students. And uh, <clears throat> this um, uh, string theory, I want to say a little bit more, this 10-dimensional uh, world. Uh, <clears throat> That means uh, six. What are the, the six dimensions? Are uh, uh, compactified into small uh, bubbles, as I already mentioned. And what is the nature of that uh, <coughs> compact manifold? And that will lead more information. I will not say more about it, but I want to say one thing. Now we know that in addition to the one-dimensional string, string theory automatically contains two-dimensional objects called membranes, and in fact, brains of higher dimensions, up to nine dimensions are possible. So, string theory is the relativistic quantum dynamics of a mind-boggling variety of interacting extended objects, chair, tables, um, planets, everything living in a 10-dimensional world. Remember, it has to be relativistic and quantum mechanical. It is rich mathematics and physics. It is that richness which is being continually discovered. Uh, no wonder string theory is so difficult and so many physicists have shied away from it. That is unfortunate. But fortunately, in India, many bright students get attracted to string theory. Finally, string theory will be mastered through mathematics. So that is another uh, <coughs> message I want to leave. Anybody who is theoretically oriented, any bright student who is theoretically oriented should go to string theory. String theory is the top candidate for a correct theory of quantum gravity which is the next frontier in fundamental physics after the spectacular success of the standard model of high energy physics. Uh, our string theory <coughs> is so complex that it requires all the mathematics that is yet to be created, which is being created now. Many string theories are creating new mathematics even. So this is the ideal area for ambitious students who are mathematically oriented. Yeah, I have already discussed this. I think now I have almost come to the end, I think. Let me go to the last page. Yeah, uh, many people have contributed to the construction of the standard model, both experimenters and theorists. Some have been recognized by Nobel Prizes. Glacial Salam, Weinberg, as I already mentioned in the history, uh, they constructed the electric theory much before this, but in 1979 only they were recognized by a Nobel Prize. Uh, Ribia and Van der Meer in 1984, they discovered the W and Z, which I mentioned. Actually, Van der Meer is uh, not even uh, a physicist, he's an engineer. But it is his engineering skill which uh, helped to accumulate enough number of antiprotons. There was a machine <coughs> uh, which had protons and antiprotons made to collide in order to produce an W and Z. So uh, new machines were created through Van der Meer's uh, technique and that is why although he was an engineer, he was given Nobel Prize. Friedman, Kendall and Taylor observed the quarks, observed within inverted commas. You cannot observe because they do not come out of the uh, <coughs> con confinement prison. But uh, I mean, that uh, I cannot describe now. Later in my lectures, you will see these so called deep inelastic <coughs> scattering experiments, how they indirectly observed quarks. And that was the first experimental convert, uh, confirmation of the idea of quarks. Tooth and Weltman showed that this electrovic theory of Glacier Salam Seinberg satisfy the criterion of renormalizability, which is very important. For, because otherwise, uh, the, as I already mentioned briefly, uh, every quantum field theory is uh, has a big problem, namely everything comes out uh, infinite and you make it finite by using the technique of renormalizability and it is possible for this theory and that they proved. So they got the prize. Gross, Pulitzer and Wilczek, <coughs> this observed, uh, observation was possible because quarks, although they are uh, strongly interacting, as observed by a deep inelastic probe, they uh, behave like free particles, that is called asymptotic freedom. And Gross, Pulitzer, and Wilkser showed that the Yangmel's theory alone has the property of asymptotic freedom. I will discuss it later. And that is how QCD came out to be the correct theory. The number I already mentioned, spontaneous breaking of symmetry idea, is the <coughs> other pioneer of that. And Kobayashi and Moskova already mentioned matter antimatter asymmetry coming from the three generations of quarks and leptons. It was they who pointed out in just one paragraph in a long paper which was useless, but that one paragraph <laughs> contains this mechanism of matter-antimatter asymmetry which will explain why all the antimatter uh, <coughs> uh, went away in the universe. 
and so they got the, all of them got the price. Then finally, Higgs mechanism got the price. Uh, uh, Higgs and Brout and Englert also did it around the same time. Brout had uh, passed away, so Englert and Higgs. The Nobel Committee made a big mistake here. Nobel Committee has made many big mistakes. They should have included Kibble because without Kibble there is no standard model. But they, anyway, Englert and Higgs got the price for the Higgs mechanism. Yeah, this I have already mentioned. Laws of nature are written in the language. I think I did not say that. Uh, laws of nature are written in the language of mathematics. But the laws can be discovered or disproved only through experiments or direct observation. So these are the laws of uh, Galileo actually. So that is the end of it. Uh, <clears throat> so if there are questions, shall we take up for the next five minutes? Any questions? Of course, I wanted to say one thing. You may not be able to ask all the questions here. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, 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 will, uh, I will give my email address uh, in my, uh, when I go to the blackboard. And uh, you can ask the questions through email anytime, and I will be able to answer them to the best of my possibility. But if you are, want to ask any short questions, you can do that. Now. Define the uh, spin of the uh, Sorry, what is, what is the question? It is about string theory, right? Uh, in string theory, yes. all the fundamental particles are uh, one dimensional string. No, 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 that is not what I said. All the fundamental particles which we have studied in standard model, for instance, are <coughs> vibrational states of that string. Okay? They are vibrational states. They all get unified into one string. Uh, Each particle is so not a string. Can, Hello? So how can they define a spin? Which See, that, that will lead to more going into details of string theory. So I will give you a general article which I have written about string theory if you want. Uh, <clears throat> or we can discuss it uh, uh, through email. Uh, you see, every, uh, every um, finite sized object in quantum mechanics uh, has ground state and higher excited states, like hydrogen atom, for instance. So this thing being a finite object, finite dimensional object, there is a dimension, although it is very small, it has ground state and excited states. These ground state and excited states are identified as the different fundamental particles. You have to solve the dynamics of string theory to understand this connection. Question is in particular how the spin comes to the excited state. Spin? Yes. Actually, the excited states all have spin, integer spins, for instance. The ground state has zero spin, excited state has got spin one, spin two, and so on. Like in the hydrogen atom, in the Bohr model, for instance, the ground state has uh, zero angular momentum and the excited states have higher angular momentum. It is somewhat like that. Any other question? Let us continue these discussions uh, through email. That is a better medium. Uh, <clears throat> I can go to details. I can give you references uh, to books or my articles. So uh, we cannot answer everything uh, <clears throat> directly like that. Uh, you have also to study the books and uh, uh, Articles, but I will indicate. I will indicate the answer. Uh, yeah. In the chat also. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, I think there are no other questions. Okay. In the okay. So we can meet then after. The yeah. So we will meet after fifteen minutes for my second lecture. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so the next one uh, we, we have to go to the blackboard. Huh? So I turn around and then go there. Huh? I leave the call, sir. 
Leave the, yeah, this can be, uh, yeah, you can leave. Uh, correct eleven uh, thirty. Huh? So eleven thirty and eleven.
Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. I am able to hear you, sir. Yes, sir. Very good. You can see the board, no? Can you see? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay, okay. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Sir, in the videos, we on the YouTube upload for you, no? Amma. So, Satya and uh, Joseph, can I start now? Or should I wait? Uh, maybe. Uh, hello? Yes, yes, now fine, sir. Yes. I can start now? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. I think we can ask all the participants to yeah. pin the screen of the board so that you will see the entire yeah. board. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is it full of kalama? Then I can, so that I will know exactly what they see. Ah, this is better, right? But you will have an inverted image, but they will see a ah. correct image. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, you can start. Okay. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. Oh, it's okay. I'm not using the mask anyway. I'm just putting yeah, it. Just no, yeah. yeah. Okay, so shall we start? So, this is my lecture too. Uh, 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 is my handwriting visible? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so, let me start with some preliminaries first. Preliminaries. Uh, before I start my lecture, I, I said I will give you my email address graj at imsc.res.in. So, anybody who has any question, please ask me through email, then I can ex explain it uh, <coughs> uh, in detail. <coughs> uh, first, uh, let me um, give you a list of books from which you can learn <coughs> much more than what I have. Griffiths, Elementary Particles, it's a very good book. Perkins, Bellatini, these are the others, exact title will be something to do with either high energy physics or elementary particle physics. Uh, <coughs> Halzen and Martin, which is, these are elementary, these better, uh, this is somewhat more uh, advanced, Halzen and Martin, more theoretical. This is a very good book. Uh, these are written by experimentalists, so you will get the experimental point of view. Halzen and Martin are theories, so it is more advanced. And then uh, uh, my articles, I will mention the articles as I go along. I have written various review articles <coughs> from which you can get uh, some information. Okay, uh, the first thing I talk uh, about are the so-called fundamental units. Uh, 
fundamental units. See normally you know dimensions etc. you learn in physics uh, <coughs> mass, uh, mass, uh, length and time are supposed to be the three fundamental dimensions in physics. But uh, all that is based on, on some arbitrariness. We choose uh, <coughs> some uh, 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 kilogram <coughs> maintained in some museum and some uh, bar uh, maintained in a museum uh, as uh, <coughs> basic units and then write down all of physics quantities in terms, it is very arbitrary. Instead of that, now we can set up fundamental units, fundamental units and dimensions by choosing H cross, the Planck's constant, the constant of quantum mechanics as 1 and also the speed of light which is the fundamental constant of relativity as 1. Once you choose this, everything, all the formula become much simpler. You can put back H cross and see by the usual dimensional counting. So, if you do this, you can see that energy dimension is the same as mass. That is clear because E equal to mc squared. So, C equal to 1. So, energy and mass have the same dimension and then uh, <coughs> you will have momentum also same because Einstein's formula is not that. It is actually as I mentioned in the morning, m squared c power 4 plus p squared c squared. So, once you put c equal to 1, p, m and d have the same dimension. And then uh, <coughs> uh, since Planck's formula is uh, E equal to h nu, you can see from this that h uh, has a h cross or h has the dimension of uh, erg second as a unit of erg second energy into time. And, oh yeah, I tend to write too small. So from this equation it follows that h or h cross has the dimension of uh, the energy Uh, into time. And since we are putting h cross equal to 1, energy and time have inverse dimension. So, I have to write uh, t in the dimension of time. By this, I mean the dimensions. Since c has been put 1, a time and length have the same dimension. So, there is only one basic dimension, call it length from which all the other dimensions are derived. This is a very, this, this has great advantage <coughs> in simplicity, simplifying all the formulae. Another thing I want to mention is uh, the units which we will use for energy and mass are electron volt. One electron volt in terms of uh, conventional units is 1.6 into 10 power minus 12 erg. And, uh, and mass and uh, energy are the same. So, we will use mass also, mass also to, to, uh, to mention masses, we will always mention them in terms of uh, this energy unit, electron volt or MeV or uh, KeV or MeV or uh, GeV, uh, MeV is 10 power 6, then there is GeV which is 10 power 9 and then TeV, these are the, <coughs> the units we will use for the energy as well as mass. And uh, okay. uh, one more important equation I will mention. Since energy and length have inverse relationship, energy in GeV you can work it out is equal to something like 0 0.2, but more exactly 0 0.192, I think that is enough. You can uh, develop to any level of accuracy divided by length in 10 power minus 13 centimeter. If you put length in 10 power minus 13 centimeter, which is also called Fermi uh, inverse, multiply by pi 2, you will get energy automatically in GeV. So, this is an important formula. Please verify this. This is an exercise for you. If you know the values of uh, <coughs> cross and C, you can verify this. So, fundamental units and dimensions, which simplifies uh, <coughs> all of physics. Okay. So, correspondingly, correspondingly let me talk about uh, the scales <coughs> in high energy physics. You 
a length and an energy corresponding energy. Well, we can write it down for uh, the size of the atom 10 power minus 8 centimeter, and then the size of the nucleon 10 power minus 13 centimeter. And then uh, 10 power minus 17 centimeter, the length scale which we have reached in present day physics. And then the Planck length which I mentioned in the morning, length scale of quantum gravity 10 power minus 33 centimeter. What are the corresponding energies? This, if you use this formula, we can verify that it comes to be 200 MeV. Or 0.2 GeV, and <clears throat> this will come to I think 2 TeV or 2000 GeV. This comes to 10 power 19 GeV. This I mentioned in the morning. What is this uh, length? That is called the Planck scale. So let me mention it here. <clears throat> Planck scale, which is the scale of uh, quantum gravity, uh, or uh, string theory, that is the fundamental scale of quantum gravity or string theory. Uh, so let us call it EP which is actually in uh, square root of inverse of uh, Newton's constant of gravitation. To go, come to con uh, conventional units, you have to put some h cross and c. Since g n is very small, that is why E p is very large. Uh, correspondingly, the length scale of Planck, Planck uh, <coughs> length is called is square root of g n. We are there inverse. I mean, it is called Planck scale because after he uh, discovered the so called Planck's constant, he realized that, that by combining uh, <coughs> Newton's constant of gravitation g, speed of light c, and his own constant h cross, you can create these numbers. And that play a very important role now in uh, quantum gravity theory. Uh, it may be a good exercise to put the actual numbers here. There may be 2 or pi, things like that, h cross and c. Instead of uh, writing this, you can uh, now put the equalities if you can work out the actual h cross and c and so on. Okay, simultaneously, let me talk about the <coughs> uh, see the particle physics which I am going to talk about, which we are going to study, originated uh, from two sources in the beginning. One, nuclear physics, where uh, proton things like that come and then uh, cosmic rays. Cosmic rays took over. Many of the particles which I will be describing today uh, were discovered in cosmic rays. And uh, <coughs> then particle uh, accelerators took over. So now it is mostly accelerators which are making the advances, except for some areas of particle physics like neutrino physics where cosmic rays still are used. So <coughs> let me start with LEP, the large electron positron collider at uh, CERN. Uh, which had a 200 GeV ultimately, 100 GeV electron, 100 GeV positron going in circling and colliding. And uh, <coughs> that is what uh, made the study of electrovic physics, especially the properties of G boson, uh, <coughs> very convenient. And all the properties uh, were discovered and they were confronted with uh, uh, theory and they all agreed beautifully. And that was a clear confirmation of electrovic theory. But then Tevatron, which is a hadronic machine, I think it was PP, proton on proton, circular machines, 2 TeV, 1 TeV on one, one proton, another uh, uh, beam of 1 TeV protons circulating and colliding, Tevatron, which worked for many years and made many discoveries, especially the top quark discovery was the most important discovery. But then now the most important machine is the large hadron collider at CERN, which uh, made the Higgs boson discovery possible and it is capable of going up to 14 TeV, maybe a little bit more they can go. So this, this is the uh, present day machine which is still <coughs> uh, giving out data. Okay, so 
that much for pre uh, preliminaries. So let me now start with the particle list. I start with the list of particles and then um, <coughs> mentioning the uh, their properties and also how they were discovered and that is the way I start my lectures. Particle list. Let me start with photon. Photon of course. Uh, <coughs> Uh, let me say corresponding history also I will give here because it is, it is best to <coughs> study physics uh, along with the history because then it becomes much more interesting. So I will try to emphasize the historical points as I go along. Okay, photon was uh, <coughs> basically discovered by uh, Planck and Einstein, Planck 1900 black body radiation and Einstein photoelectric effect 1905. Then let us talk about the electron. Uh, here in this uh, is a table of particle properties, particle properties. Mass I will give here. Mass mostly I will mention MeV. If I do not mention it means MeV and uh, its internal angular momentum called spin uh, <coughs> which we will call J. So I will call it J. J is the spin remember <coughs> and then uh, lifetime if it decays most of the particles decay so lifetime mean life. <coughs> okay. The electron mass is 0.51 MeV and its spin is half, lifetime is infinite. Uh, so for electron we should mention J.J. Thomson. So apart from photon, electron is the first elementary particle discovered that was discovered by J.J. Thomson in cathode ray studies in the year 1894 or 86, I do not remember. These years may have plus or minus one <laughs> ambiguity. For history, when I mention history, I should mention uh, you should read this book, which is a very, very good book. Abraham Pius, Inward Bound. It is a very beautiful book. My own article I will mention here. Historical panorama of particle physics by GR and it is there in the archive. I hope all of you know how to go to archive in the computer. Archive, the physics section of archive. It was written in 2006, 06, 0, 3, 2, 1, 3, 1, 0, 2, 1, 3, 1. Okay, these are books relevant for history. Okay, next comes, next comes some other thing, but uh, <coughs> I will complete this uh, uh, table and then go to the other ones. So let me mention mu, muon, which as I said is heavy electron discovered by Homi Baba, mass is 105. 0.7 MeV, spin is again how and lifetime is microsecond, 2.6 into 10 power minus 6 seconds, this is second. And then still heavier uh, <coughs> electron called it tau which was discovered only uh, in accelerators and its mass is about 1400, precise mass you can get. Uh, by the way, uh, I will come to that later, spin is how and its lifetime is about 10 power minus uh, 12 second I think. Correspondingly there are neutrinos, nu e, nu mu, 
mu tau. Mass are not 0, but I will simply put them as 0, up, up, uh, very nearly 0, is very tiny, is even less than electron volt because the mass discovery is important, but here we will simply mention it as 0. All of them are spin half particles and uh, <coughs> we do not know about their lifetime whether they decay at all, we do not know. This is one of the unknown <coughs> questions about neutrinos. These are all called uh, leptons as I already mentioned in the morning. Then comes the hadrons. The first hadron of course is proton, the uh, <coughs> nucleus of the hydrogen atom and mass is uh, 938. Please warn me whenever I go to small letters. These letters you can see or is it too small? Hello? Are these letters too small or? Uh, I will make them slightly bigger. Okay, I will, I will try. I, I, I will remember. This is 938 you can see, right? 938. Yeah. Spin is again half and uh, lifetime is as of now 10 power larger than 10 power 34 or 33 years. Whether proton lives forever or decays is an important question uh, <coughs> connected with the grand unified theory which I mentioned in the morning. All grand unified theories predict that proton decays. So experimentally uh, <coughs> it is a very big project which is going on like neutrino physics, proton lifetime, proton decay also is an important experiment and nobody has uh, <coughs> discovered, uh, uh, the, uh, nobody has discovered that it decays but that is an important question to be decided in future. Neutron which is larger because neutron is able to decay into this. So, 939.6 MeV when is half. Neutron decays into proton. Proton cannot decay into neutron because it does not, does not have any of enough energy. If the mass of a particle is smaller than the sum of masses, it is possible decay products, the particle cannot decay. Only if the mass is smaller. So, neutron can decay into proton, proton can decay into neutron, but inside the nucleus proton can decay because there the energetics should be considered by using the whole mass of the nucleus. And so there are many nuclei in which many nuclear decays are due to the decay of proton, proton going to neutron and neutron going to proton also occurs. And the neutron of course since it decays, it decays by weak interactions and <coughs> its lifetime is about uh, I think about 12 minutes, 887 I have written. 887 seconds I already written here. Then comes, uh, okay, proton discovery I should say was Rutherford. He was the first one to discover that the nuclei exist. So, hydrogen nucleus he identified with proton in the year 1911. And his student uh, discovered the neutron. Chadwick. Rutherford uh, speculated that neutron also exists and then asked uh, Chadwick to look for it and uh, in, uh, in one particular nuclear reaction Chadwick could produce it. Uh, now, <coughs> okay. Here I do not know, so look at uh, Pai's uh, book to get further details. Then I already mentioned uh, in the morning uh, pion predicted by Yukawa as the particle which is exchanged between nucleons in order to produce the nuclear force. Uh, now we know that is not the complete story, QCD has to be <coughs> brought in. Pion mass is 140 MeV, uh, a little above the uh, muon mass, remember that and its spin is 0 and pi, on, pi, pi on comes in 3 varieties, pi plus, pi minus and pi 0. Pi 0 I think is 138 MeV, its spin also is 0. Pi plus minus decays in about 10 power minus 8 seconds, so 2.6, 10 power minus 8 seconds. Pi 0 decays by electromagnetic interaction into 2 gammas and so its 
lifetime is shorter, decay rate is higher. So, li lifetime is shorter 8 into 10 power minus 17 seconds. So, these are all called hadrons. These are all strongly interacting particles. So, they are called hadrons. So, that is the classification. The fermions which do not have strong interactions are called leptons and the others are called hadrons. And uh, the discovery of uh, pion, there is an important uh, thing we should say. Pion theoretical prediction was Yukawa. Again, here I am not very sure, around in the 30s. 1934 or so. See, once uh, <coughs> Yukawa predicted the existence of pion, which is about 200 times as massive as the electron on the basis of the range of the nuclear force, um, and a particle uh, <coughs> muon was discovered in cosmic rays by uh, Homi Baba, and the track was see, seen by uh, <coughs> Anderson, Carl Anderson. Uh, they jumped to the conclusion that uh, this muon, which was seen, uh, is the Yukawa particle, but uh, it led a lot of confusion. It took many years before that confusion was clarified uh, <coughs> by uh, Powell and Okialini. Okialini. Uh, <coughs> only uh, I think after the war, after the Second World War, was over photographic uh, emulsion plates uh, <coughs> uh, were invented in order to study the tracks of cosmic ray particles. Using them, Powell and Ocalini could actually see uh, <coughs> a pionic track uh, and then uh, a break here, so another track which was interpreted as mu, pi decays into mu. So, it is Powell and Ocalini who uh, clarified the uh, uh, cleared all the mess and clarified the situation by saying pion and muon are different particles, pi decays into mu along with it, yeah, neutrino also is emitted and mu also decays into the electron and two neutrinos, one neutrino and one antineutrino. So, they could see, uh, of course, these uh, neutrinos cannot be seen but they could see these tracks pi, mu and e with the two kings. So, it was a clear establishment of the pi and mu decays and uh, I think they were Paul and Nokialini also got Nobel Prize for that. Now, at this point I should mention another theoretical discovery, important theoretical discovery of Heisenberg, the same Heisenberg who was a pioneer in uh, quantum mechanics. Once proton and neutron were discovered with mass close by and also <coughs> they could do scattering experiment between proton and proton and proton and neutron. Neutron, neutron is difficult that has to be guessed from nuclear physics. Uh, they found that the proton neutron force and the proton proton force and the <coughs> neutron neutron force were identical, same strength all are attractive. Of course, when I say uh, proton, proton force, I am ignoring the Coulomb force. Coulomb force is repulsive, but apart from Coulomb force, the existence of strong force was recognized because otherwise without that strong force, they will not be bound inside the nucleus. So, the strong forces were identified and they were found to be equal among the protons and neutrons. So, Heisenberg suggested that there is a symmetry between proton and neutron which is called isospin symmetry. Mathematically, it corresponds to the group SU2. We will talk about it, talk about the mathematics later. But I can say that isospin symmetry, SU2 symmetry is like the symmetry uh, uh, in uh, for angular momenta. Everybody knows about the angular momenta. Electron has got the spin angular momentum, spin half, and if it has spin half, either spin, uh, spin half can have two directions, spin up and spin down, we call it. Both spin up and spin down will have the same energy unless you put a magnetic field which breaks that uh, degeneracy. Uh, let us not put a magnetic field in free space, the electron of spin uh, how spin up and spin down have the same mass and the same energy. In the same way, they suggested that proton and neutron 
have iso spin hub is not ordinary spin this is a mathematical spin which uh, has a good explanation only if you go to the group theory of SU2. But the group theory of SU2 is exactly the same as the group theory of the angular momentum algebra I hope you have studied angular momentum algebra and angular momentum. The angular momentum commutation relations and from that how you derive that the total angular momentum can be half uh, 1, uh, 0 can be there 0, half 3 by 2 and so on. If it is half the third component of angular momentum can be either plus half or minus half. So <coughs> like that proton and neutron have got uh, I3, let us call it I3, let me write down here, I think it is better way of writing it. So this is I equal to half. Similarly, the pi also has isospin, all the strongly interacting particles have isospins and pi plus, pi minus and pi 0, it is a triplet and so it should have I equal to 1. So, <coughs> Heisenberg uh, discovered isospin symmetry of strong interactions and in particular he identified proton and neutron as I equal to half objects. Then after pions were discovered, not only charged pion, neutral pion also exists. The three of them are the three components and these have I3 uh, plus 1, minus 1 and 0. Whereas I3 here is plus half for proton and minus half for neutron. Of course, proton and neutron do not have exactly same mass and that is because proton has a charge and because of that there is electromagnetic self energy and that contributes to the difference. Similarly, pi plus pi, mi pi minus is antiparticle to pi plus. So, one of the important theorems in quantum fall theory that particles and antiparticles should have exactly the same mass. So, pi plus and minus have this mass 140 mv, whereas pi 0 has different mass. Uh, so, the, the different members of an iso multiplet can have slightly different masses, but on the whole, you know, they are about 140, this is about 940. We ignore that mass difference. So, that is the important discovery of Heisenberg, uh, which again happened around the year 1934 or 35. Please check the exact years. Okay. So, any questions in this part? I can answer them straight away before I go to the further development. Any questions? You can ask me later also anytime or through email. <coughs> okay. So, let me now go to the next step in the study of particle physics. So, I am following the historical development here. There is another way of teaching or learning particle physics, a more, uh, uh, I would say that is the logical way now. Now that we have got standard model, you start with standard model and discuss all the consequences. They will be the particle physics. That is the inverse of this. What I am doing is the historical path. I will do this and then come to standard model. That is the conventional path. Okay, if there are no questions here, I can wrap it off. So, I continue to continue the uh, discussion of hadrons, there is a lot more to be said. For leptons, there is nothing much to be said unless, until we come to the leap, weak interactions. For hadrons, the strong interaction is very complicated. The story of hadrons and how the strong interaction puzzle was finally solved in terms of QCD is a very, very complicated story. I think part of it you can see from this article, I have discussed it here. Hadrons come in two varieties, baryons which are fermions and mesons which are, which are bosons. So, instead of writing proton and neutron separately, I will write nucleon, the whole isospin multiplet 
proton and neutron are two members of this nucleon and mass in MeV and uh, <coughs> angular momentum along with it another property called parity, the internal parity just like the internal spin there is an internal parity also. What does that do? Uh, in uh, <coughs> quantum mechanics every object is uh, comes with a wave function and the wave function can have a parity. Parity corresponds to the space inversion, the space coordinate r vector goes to minus r, similar reflection. Uh, <coughs> under that, uh, how the wave function behaves, so you already know in hydrogen atom you would have studied the parity or even in harmonic oscillator, the parity is alternate in different levels. Uh, here we are talking about the internal parity. In addition to that, uh, you assign a parity either plus 1 or minus 1 for every elementary particle. So, that is called internal parity, JP. Then isospin, which is an important quantum number of hadrons. Then another quantity which I am going to introduce called strangeness. And then the lifetime in seconds. Nine hundred and forty, I will write. There is a slight difference between proton and neutron, as I already mentioned. How parity is? So actually, this is the definition. Nucleon is defined to have positive parity, half plus positive parity, and all other parities are relative to the <coughs> this. Some will have a negative or minus respectively. Isospin, as I already said, is half. So it has two members, proton and neutron. Strangeness is zero, but I will come to strangeness later. And tau, I already mentioned, so I will not talk about it. Neutron is unstable by weak interaction. Neutron decays into proton plus the electron of a negative charge plus neutrino as we already know. Whereas proton does not decay as far as we know, but it might decay if grand unified theory is correct. Lambda, now comes <coughs> these particles, discovery of strangeness. So I think I should talk about the discovery of strangeness before coming to this, because that is an important milestone in uh, Hadronic physics, baryons and mesons, I will open up another region here. So, discovery of strings. How it was discovered. Strangeness is denoted by the letter S. Yes. That happened through the following puzzle. <coughs> uh, it was seen that uh, <coughs> some particles, which I am going to introduce here, lambda, I could have completed this with the mass higher than 940 and 1115. Spin parity is half plus, isospin is 0, strangeness we will come to, and the lifetime about 10 power minus 10 seconds by weak interaction. Then sigma, which is a triplet, isospin triplet, so A equal to 1, mass and spin parity, strangeness is also about 10 power minus 10 seconds. And, uh, another particle called cascade, 1320 mass, half plus spin, isospin half, again lifetime 10 power minus 10 seconds and then another called particle called omega minus which is 1670 MeV. This is not spin 3 by 2, it is also fermion, because all half integral <coughs> spin particles are fermion and uh, isospin 0 and the lifetime 10 power minus 10. Now there is an important di uh, discovery connected with these particles and that is what I am describing here, discovery. So that came from the following puzzle. It was found that uh, for instance, uh, the cosmic ray collision of proton with a neutron in uh, nitrogen uh, or oxygen uh, uh, 
nucleus in the atmosphere uh, can create these particles sigma minus. Sigma is a triplet, it comes in three varieties. <coughs> this is proton and neutron, this is single, whereas this is sigma plus, sigma minus, sigma 0 and sigma minus, whereas this is cascade 0 and cascade minus, this is a singlet. Sigma minus <coughs> k plus, oh I have to introduce that also. So I should talk about this only after discussing mesons. Mesons pi <coughs> uh, em jp i strenuous and lifetime. Uh, pi we have already discussed that was a triplet uh, 140 mev although the uh, the different members have different masses slightly different masses. Spin parity is 0 minus, parity is minus now. That is when you talk about the pionic wave function you have to put an extra minus sign for spatial reflection and pion is an isospin triplet as I already mentioned. Stanginess you will come to tau uh, lifetime is about 10 power minus 8 second although <coughs> second in second although the pi 0 is electromagnetic decay so it is much much uh, <coughs> shorter lifetime than this. Uh, <coughs> then now uh, there is k meson 9 490 mev 0 minus I suspend half under 9 10 power minus 8 second. Then there is eta meson 550 mev 0 minus uh, I suspend uh, 0 and this again, this is again electromagnetic decay, so it is uh, much shorter 10 power minus 15 second. Okay. Now these particles and these particles are called strange particles, how were they discovered? It was found experimentally that proton and neutron when they collide, with have, they have sufficient energy. Cosmic ray particles, well, cosmic rays are nothing but very high energy protons even going up to 10 GeV uh, <coughs> which are uh, running around in the universe all the time. We still do not know the exact origin of the cosmic rays although it was discovered more than 100 years ago uh, <coughs> and uh, cosmic rays contributed so much to particle physics as I already mentioned in fact many of these, all these particles were discovered in cosmic rays. And uh, so since they have very high energy, uh, when they collide with the atmospheric nuclei, they can produce many particles. That is how many particles were originally discovered. As I already said, photographic emulsions were sent by balloons, sometimes even by spacecraft later. And uh, they recorded the tracks, they brought them down and by looking through microscope, that was a big industry. Until uh, this uh, uh, research was taken over by uh, particle accelerators. But to a certain extent it still continues because some of the things can be done only in cosmic rays like in neutrino physics. Uh, sigma minus k plus uh, <coughs> plus proton. We have to always, first thing we have to worry about is the charge, whether charge uh, is balanced. Minus 1, plus 1, plus 1, so plus 1 and 0, okay. And this uh, went as a strong interaction. The cross section for this was typical of strong interaction. The coupling constant was of that order of magnitude 1. So this is called strong production. But when these guys decayed, sigma minus or sigma plus for instance, sigma plus decayed into uh, <coughs> Sigma minus I have written here is sigma plus. Yeah. Well, sigma plus you can write down correspondingly. Uh, let me give the decay of sigma plus here. Uh, it decays into, let me write down sigma minus for instance. Sigma minus will decay into n and uh, uh, pi minus. <coughs> k minus will decay into pi minus pi plus pi 0. Many of these particles have many decay modes, many alternative paths for decay. This is a 2 pi mode of k decay and this is the 3 pi and this, this is very important later when we come to <coughs> discuss weak interactions. Now 
the lifetimes of these when you compute it in terms of the coupling constant, uh, that coupling constant was characteristic of weak interaction, the Fermi coupling constant which I already mentioned, so of weak decay. So why is it that when uh, they are produced, uh, it is produced by strong interaction, why does not uh, <coughs> they decay also by strong interaction? The reason is there is an important new quantum number called strangeness and strangeness is conserved in strong interactions, but it need not be conserved in weak interactions. It is a new quantum number, strangeness is conserved here. So these are all uh, strangeness uh, <coughs> 0 objects. So this is a strangeness 0 total initially and finally this is <coughs> 0 and uh, this also has to be 0 and so they have to have opposite strangeness. But coming to decay, this is strangeness, uh, <coughs> strange object. So uh, <coughs> let us put strangeness minus 1. This is the assignment given by uh, Gelman and uh, Nishijima. They were the discoverer of this new quantum number, Gelman and Nishijima. So as I said, here strangeness need not be concerned. Strangeness is a minus 1 here, but strangeness is 0. Uh, and so it cannot, this cannot be a strong interaction, cannot be a strong decay. It has to be weak decay. Namely, the lifetime has to be characteristic of weak interactions. Similarly, this also. Sigma minus uh, strangeness minus 1. And this is plus 1 because this is 0. <coughs> K is a doublet, the two members being K plus and K0. This is triplet as I already mentioned. And strangeness for both of these is plus 1. Maybe I should write down the anti K also. Anti K, which is K0 bar and K minus. Mass is same because antiparticles have to have the same mass as K. Of course, between K plus and K0, there will be a, a <coughs> difference in mass by a few MeV as I already men mentioned. That is called the electromagnetic mass difference. And uh, <coughs> so that has strangeness minus 1. Eta has strangeness 0. That I have completed. Now, let me complete this now. Lambda has to have strangeness minus 1 and cascade have to have strangeness minus 2 and omega minus f of strangeness minus 3. So how do we get it? So if these are uh, non-strange and this is strange, uh, minus 1, this is also minus 1, these are non-strange. So they have to decay by weak interaction. Here they have to be balanced. So this is called associated uh, production. This word associated production was apparently coined by our own M. G. K. Manan who was a former director of DFR. So anyway, he was in the Bristol group at that time. And um, so the associated production, can, uh, strangeness gets two strange, strange particles have opposite strangeness have to be created if initial strangeness is 0. Then it can be a strong interaction process. Whereas here uh, you can see that uh, uh, you cannot write down anything uh, uh, which will allow it to decay. Because remember the total mass has to be smaller than this. That you can always check whenever I write down any process. That is the first thing. The charge conservation and uh, the mass uh, hierarchy has to be always checked. Whenever I write down, whenever you write down any any process, any any scattering process or production process or any decay process. So you can check that. You cannot write down any particles here which will uh, <coughs> have strangeness conservation because all the strange particles are heavy. That is the reason. So that is the invention of the strangeness quantum number, but I have to give you more details now. For that, uh, <coughs> let us start with the nucleon and phi. For both of them, you can easily check the charge within an isomultiplet. Of course, uh, depends on I3. Remember, uh, proton and neutron have got I3 equal to plus half and minus half, so charge differs. Here also it is plus 1, 0, minus 1. The, the I3 and correspondingly charge differs. So charge is proportional to I3, that was the first thing to be noticed. But that is not enough, it has to be shifted by uh, half unit because uh, the isospin is plus half but charge is plus 1. Isospin is minus half but charge is 0. So plus half you have to add 
So that plus half has to be added half. Um, so let us call it, I introduce another quantum number called baryon, which I did not, baryon number, which I so far I have not <coughs> put. So all these ba ba so called baryons are baryon number one. And that is why the proton and neutron are stable. Otherwise, they would have disappeared. Proton would have de uh, uh, decayed into, let us say, a uh, yeah, positron and photon. That is not possible because baryon number is one for these objects and for the leptons, baryon number is zero. And so it is not also baryon number conservation is very important and baryon number conservation is violated in a grand unified theory. So it allows proton to decay. So that is the baryon number. <coughs> And you can see that this uh, agrees with the pi on also because pi plus pi minus pi zero, pi zero, pi minus, let me write like that. Uh, you can see that these are uh, I3 equal to plus one, zero, minus one, and that is exactly the charge. So baryon number is zero here. Here baryon number is plus one for all these objects. And uh, <coughs> Uh, there are anti baryons where baryon number will be opposite. Uh, for anti particles, many of these quantum numbers will be reversed. Strangeness and baryon number will be reversed. So, this at least agrees both for, I mean, this is a correct formula for describing uh, Q in terms of I3 for both the nucleonic doublet and the pionic. But that is not true, you can see, uh, for the so called strange particles. So that can be illustrated by another figure. So where do I put that figure now? So let me plot the charge here for these particles. Charge minus 1, 0 and plus 1. Let me write a vertical axis also. That is not axis, this is just to separate the different particles. For a nucleonic doublet, a, a neutron comes here and a proton comes here. This is a neutron and this is proton. Uh, whereas uh, the pi is more symmetrical, pi minus, pi 0, pi plus. So <coughs> Q is the same as the I3, so it is more symmetrical. And this is shifted, that is the point. The shift is given by this formula. But if you look at lambda, which is also a baryon, I3 is the same as the charge, but baryon number one. So you have to nullify this by adding the strangeness and choosing strangeness minus one for the lambda. Similarly, for all the strange particles. sigma minus sigma 0 and sigma plus. There also I suspend I3 is the same as, remember uh, like in angular momentum theory where the total angular momentum as well as the third component can be specified, nothing else can be specified because of uh, <coughs> uh, non-vanishing commutator between the different components of the angular momentum vector. Same thing for I suspend. Mathematics is exactly the same. You can specify the total I suspend as well as the I3 value. The I3 values help to distinguish between the different members of an isospin multiplet. That is what you have to understand. Cascade gets shifted this way. Cascade minus cascade 0. Uh, and uh, K, K gets shifted this way. K0 and k plus, anti k goes in the other direction, k0 bar and k minus. So that completes the whole picture. So you can see that in order to get to the positive or negative shifts, you have to choose the strangeness quantum number appropriately. That is why, I, if you now look at all these, uh, <coughs> all these uh, strangeness quantum numbers which have been given here, uh, you will see that this formula is satisfied. And this was the formula discovered by gelman nishijima So this is called the gelman nishijima formula. Gelman's name comes 
often in particle physics, especially in hadronic physics. This was the first time he <coughs> contributed. Then until the discovery of the quarks and QCD, his name is there everywhere. And he is also very good uh, in coining names. Uh, the name strangeness came from him, the name quark came from him, the name uh, PCD came from him. Okay, Gelman Nishijima formula. <coughs> I have written an article about Gelman, last year he died and uh, at that time I wrote an article about Gelman and his contributions. Uh, I think it is published in resonance last year, so please look for it. You will uh, see many of this explained there. Okay, this is the Gelman Nishijima formula. Germanisjima relation. So I have explained now this table completely now through the discovery of the strangeness. So the next step, <coughs> shall I start it now? I think we cannot complete that, but at least let me start that now. So in this, any questions about isospin? Isospin I introduced in the earlier <coughs> thing. And then now I have introduced the strangeness. These are the important quantum numbers which characterize all strongly interacting particles like baryons and mesons. Okay, shall I rub it off? That shift is actually the strangeness B plus S. This B plus S comes always in this combination. So it is also given another name, it is called hypercharge. Why? Hypercharge. So Q can be written as I3 plus the shift. Shift is by hypercharge, not by baryonic number or by strangeness alone, but it is a hypercharge which describes the shift between Q and I3. Why is equal to B plus S? It is called hypercharge. Hypercharge. It is a light charge, but uh, it is not just the electromagnetic charge, it is a component of the electromagnetic charge. Hypercharge, it is called. So hypercharge is 0 for pi ohms, for instance. So in the diagram that you have on the right hand side. Yeah, this is a diagram. Uh, uh, that diagram. Yeah. So, you are, uh, so, so let us uh, let us put the hypercharge and strangeness here. Strange, strangeness and hypercharge shall I put here? Strangeness and hypercharge. So strangeness is 0, but hypercharge is 1 because baryon, these are guys have got baryon number 1. And this has got hypercharge, uh, strangeness 0, hypercharge also 0 because baryon number is 0. This is baryon number 1 and uh, strangeness minus 1, uh, baryon number 1, strangeness minus 1, so they cancel each other. So strangeness minus 1, hypercharge is 0. And this also should be the same. And the cascade strangeness minus 2 by adding baryon number hypercharge is 1. This is baryon number uh, 0, but strangeness plus 1. This is uh, <coughs> uh, strangeness uh, minus 1 and uh, baryon number, I mean hypercharge. What have I written here? Strangeness plus 1 here and hypercharge also plus 1 because baryon number is 0. Strangeness minus 1 and so hypercharge also is minus 1, okay? Yeah. I hope I have got it right, all right? So shall I rub it off now? The next important step in the history <coughs> is the discovery of resonances, hadronic resonances. Resonances were well known in atomic physics and then in nuclear physics. Whenever two particles collide, sometimes they resonate and then the cross section becomes large and the cross section 
uh, is described by the bright wigner formula. Similar thing happened uh, in particle physics. For the first time, uh, it happened uh, the following way. Hadronic resonances. Uh, when they collided uh, pi plus on proton in the Chicago cyclotron, uh, Fermi and uh, Anderson I do not know maybe sometime in the in the 50s maybe they found that they resonate at a particular energy. They studied the cr scattering cross section for this process and the cross section when they plotted uh, sigma the sigma cross section for this process as a function of energy uh, let us plot in terms of center mass energy and in MeV, when that energy was uh, <coughs> 1232 MeV, the cross section went through a peak. This is called a bright Wigner resonance. It can be described by the bright Wigner formula. Sigma is equal to apart from other factors, there will be 1 minus E minus Vr uh, plus I gamma by 2. That is the width. Cross section will be square of this, not square of this. Cross section has to be real, not a complex number. This is called the resonance energy, and the resonance energy was 1232, and uh, this is called the half, half width. So, half width was roughly, I think, about 100 mm, 120 maybe. 100 mm, right. This was the first discovery. Uh, first uh, resonance which was discovered and uh, <coughs> now the important point, there is a, it's a theoretical point, it is very important. All resonances are particles, so this is identified as a particle called uh, delta at 1236 mass. The resonances, resonance particles are usually written like this at the mass 1236 and uh, its isospin is uh, 3 by 2 and the spin parity is equal to 3 half plus and, uh, and uh, <coughs> it comes as a resonance because this delta particle you can see can decay into nucleon and pi. All quantum numbers which have to be conserved in strong interactions are conserved here. Nucleon is only 940 MeV, this is 140 MeV, this is 1236 you can see it can go. So, this decay occurs by strong interactions. And the lifetime uh, correspondingly comes out to be uh, of the order of 10 power minus uh, 21 second. That is the typical strong interaction lifetime. I mean, you can calculate uh, the time taken for a relativistic particle uh, <coughs> traveling with speed of light almost uh, to go across uh, the, the dimension of this all these particles are about 10 power minus 13 centimeter. You will find this lifetime. But you do not uh, see the track of the particle. Instead, you see it as a width. And width again is inversely related to the lifetime. It will be 100 mm. Using the uh, <coughs> dimensions and units which I mentioned in the beginning, you can verify all these statements. So that is why, so it is the width which shows that it is a strongly interacting particle. And uh, you cannot uh, say that this is only a resonance. Proton is a <coughs> particle because that is wrong in principle. I will tell you the reason. See, neutron decays. Deuteron, which is the nucleus of the deuterium atom, du is made up of N and P. And since because of this binding energy, this N now cannot decay, so it is stable. Does it mean that deuteron is more fundamental than neutron? We know that is not true. In fact, neutron is only a composite of neutron and proton. So, <coughs> in principle, we have to club all the strongly decaying resonances also into particles. So, the uh, whole of hadronic physics becomes enormously enriched by the discovery of the uh, resonances. So, what happened was, uh, <coughs> so that is the important thing. Resonance and particle are not different. 
sometimes they will, you will see the track if the lifetime is uh, short enough so that it can live and show its track in cloud chamber or photographic emulsion. But if it decays so fast, then you can see it only in uh, its, uh, its uh, <coughs> uh, behavior, behavior of the cross section. Resonance is the same as particle. Resonance is identical to particle. This is an important thing which you have to keep in mind. And so what happened was, Subsequent to the discovery of uh, this delta resonance, delta resonance has its property because property can be guessed from uh, by adding the isospins of the initial state and so on, uh, <coughs> uh, isospin as well as ang angular momentum from the angular distribution of the process. You can measure the angular uh, uh, the, 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 the internal spin of this delta itself. So, delta is a composite of phi plus p, and phi plus p will have a certain angular distribution because of this three half. Similarly, parity also. All these things can be measured experimentally. So, our particle uh, for, uh, table for uh, hadrons becomes enormously bigger. I think it is already 12.30, maybe I should uh, stop here. So, the consequences of this are enormous for the development of particle physics. It is this which uh, gave rise to the SU3 symmetry and then quarks. I mean literally speaking hundreds of uh, uh, resonance particles were discovered. I will describe some of them and uh, that particle zoo, it was called particle zoo and uh, in fact you can get to more uh, detailed information about particle zoo by looking at the particle list uh, <coughs> which are there in. There is a thing called particle data group, PDG. I think you can go to the Google and get it and uh, they publish and uh, update it every two years. They used to do it every two years, I do not know now how they do it. And uh, you can see the enormous list of particles there, apart from the particle list which I have already given, uh, the resonance list is also will be given there. I will show part of it uh, in the next lecture, okay. So I think I will stop here unless there are questions. Okay. Any, any question? Yeah. No. Can we understand this resonance? This uh, resonance as a particle, as yeah. some kind of composite particle which is there for a short lifetime. No, it is a composite particle. All the all the hadrons. Finally, are composites of quarks. In that sense, it is composite. Now, you are asking a very deep question: whether delta can be regarded as a composite of nucleon and pi? Yeah. That is also an important question. I will take take it up later, because that corresponds to the so-called S matrix philosophy, which was an alternate philosophy. It was given up finally because it did not work. Instead of that, the quark model came. Uh, but in the beginnings, before quarks came, uh, <coughs> it was believed that all hadrons can be understood as composites of other hadrons. In fact, that is how the SU3 symmetry itself came. So all that is your question leads to very interesting answers. I will discuss it uh, next time. Since it is a resonance between nuclear and pi, you can regard uh, delta as a composite of nuclear and pi is a very valid hypothesis. Actually, it turns out that, uh, I mean that, that, that certainly many times helps in understanding it. But uh, the real composite uh, constituent is quark for both delta as well as proton and neutron. Actually proton, neutron uh, <coughs> and delta become a three quark bound state. That is what happens in the, in the, as we understand now. But uh, since the delta is much heavier than the uh, sum of the masses of the nuclear and pi, it decays and it is a decay which is exhibited as a resonance. That is the present understanding. Not because it is a composite of nuclear and pi, but because uh, the mass is higher. Yeah. So, there was one question yeah. on, your, on your previous lecture. Yeah, sure. So, this is by Jayashree. Hmm. So, you have said there is 1D, 2D, 3D impact up to 10D. Yeah. 
How do we know that uh, this uh, ten-dimensional world, which which is required in uh, string theory, is correct? For that, you have to do experiments bearing on that scale, which is 10 power minus 33 centimeter, or energy-wise 10 power 19 GeV. We don't have that. That is why we cannot do any experimental tests right now, unless you create new kinds of accelerators, which I mentioned in my last talk. Talk. Until then, it is uh, to be taken only as a uh, theory, so it is not a confirmed theory. So this is uh, the the extra six dimensions. Uh, you will be able to see as uh, some kind of soap bubbles, six dimensional soap bubbles. Every point which we consider in normal physics corresponds to a small uh, six dimensional world in itself. Now, that's only a talk. I mean, you cannot see it. Uh, you cannot experimentally probe it until you get accelerators of that high energy, 10 power 19 GeV. That is, uh, the string uh, dimension also can be seen only at that. These are all 10 power minus uh, 33 centimeter, 16 orders of magnitude more than the 10 power minus 17 centimeter, which we have reached this so far. Sir? Yeah. What is, the means, what is the paradox which you are referring to? The paradox I am referring to is that from another point of like another perspective, what we are saying now could be wrong. Yeah, whether we are saying wrong or right can be decided only by experiment. Unfortunately, we have not reached that uh, level of energy in accelerators that uh, we can say it one way or other. Right now, right now we are believing in string theory uh, in ten dimensions only because that is the only way by which we can incorporate gravity into quantum mechanics. That is the only reason. Okay. Only theoretical reason. But uh, we cannot uh, just rest satisfied with it. That is why invention of new principles of accelerations is very, very important. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. OK? Hello? Hello? Abhijit? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, these numbers, all these numbers, spin, isopin, uh, barium number, hypercharge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can say they are all eigenvalues of some operator, quantum, quantum mechanical operator. I3, for instance, is the eigenvalue of the I3 matrix. See, in angular momentum theory, uh, the m quantum number, the magnetic quantum number, are the eigenvalues of uh, J3, the third component of angular momentum. All these numbers are eigenvalues of uh, operators, the machine operators in quantum mechanics. And all, all these are real eigenvalues. Like oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Hermitian operators, therefore. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay, if there are no other questions, uh, thank you, Rajaji. So we'll meet next Saturday. Yeah, next Saturday at uh, same time, 10 o'clock. Yeah. 10 o'clock. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.